Hello and welcome to this edition of ICANN on Air. Use this opportunity also to welcome my co-anchor, Olu Sheson. Yes, we call him Sheson Okwade. Who is joining me at this edition? Sheson, you are welcome. Good evening. Good evening, sir, my main anchor. And to our listeners, my pleasure to be here this evening. Yeah, and of course, today we take a brief return to the Petroleum Industry Act 2021, we which we always call the PIA. Experts on the subject are unanimous that the PIA represents an effort by Africa's leading oil producing country to respond to changing domestic and global environment characterized by growing oil and gas firms all producing countries in the region, militants in oil-rich communities, while remaining has diminished, concerns over climate change fueling aggressive effects and efforts to reduce global consumption of fossil fuels. And this has driven divestment from the oil and gas by companies, institutions, and countries. Lately, our almighty PIA Act has been temporarily suspended in the wake of agitations against removal of subsidy on PMS. Of course, naturally, necessitating our interrogation today on Nigerian Petroleum Industry Act 2021 and the chartered accountants matters arising. Chinwedu Enechi ACA joins us in our question and answer segment to drive us to better understanding of this subject. Chinwedu Enechi is a partner in the oil and gas and power practice at Anderson, Nigeria. He specializes in providing workable tax management advisory solutions to companies in the oil and gas industry. He was and he still practice as team leader in one of the oil and gas industry, providing tax due diligence services in that company. And with that entailed, really, uh, because I was just looking at some of those backgrounds, that entailed a consideration of the fiscal and tax aspect of the PIB and other relevant legislations in the investment plan. More to unveil on our esteemed guests very shortly. Also, on this program, we are going to be sharing a few tidbits on an icon diary, letting you into a window of our world few announcements and few adverts. If you want to stay connected, 
We shall be back with you shortly. We deserve all the accolades on this special occasion of the International Women's Day. I especially recognize my queens in the Society of Women Accountants of Nigeria, SWAN, and all prospective female members of ICANN. I acknowledge that you are indeed queens, unique and elegant, breaking all gender barriers and positively impacting the accounting and finance space. Accept my hearty congratulations as I celebrate you today and always. Let's remain undaunted in our resolve to break the bias. Happy International Women's Day. Break the bias. So please join me to welcome our esteemed guest, Chiwedo Enechi, a partner in Anderson, Nigeria, into ICAD on the air. Uh, with my co anchor, Chiwendo Enechi, you're welcome to ICAN on air for today, Tuesday, March 8, 2022. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, Mr. Fatuke and uh, uh, thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to also uh, say a big thank you to the Institute for putting this together. And also welcome our online participants. And uh, we're hoping we'll have a great session today. Thank you very much. So without wasting our time, let's quickly just uh, double into the discussion of today. And uh, like you understand, we're talking about the Nigerian Petroleum Industry Act 2021 and the chartered accountant, the matters arising. Briefly, let me just ask, uh, uh, this issue of PIA, can you just give us a brief intro and also let us know if the PIA we achieve the objective of increasing our desired investment in the oil and gas industry? Well, thank you so much, uh, Shesna, for, for that question. I, I must say that, um, We've been on this journey uh, of this um, omnibus law in the oil and gas sector, which is the PIA that we have currently. Uh, we've been on, th on this journey for over a decade. Um, in the past, we've had uh, multiple uh, PIBs, as it were, you know, back then. And at some point, we had them you know, broken down into different segments. Uh, and I must say that um, at that time, it created a lot of uncertainty within the industry because investors were... Um, not really, really satisfied with what was going on, yeah, because if you understand the oil and gas industry, you realize that it's a, it's a high risk industry. And uh, if there's one thing that investors want to see, there is, is certainty. So uh, when President signed the PIA into law, um, obviously it was a welcome development in industry. Um, it brought that um, certainty that uh, we were all seeking uh, in the industry. Um, I was speaking to one of my clients back then, um, prior to the signing of the PIA, and what the client was saying to me was that um, we just want to know with certainty what is in the law, you know, so that we, we can evaluate it, look at the fiscal terms, and see if it's still favorable, if we need to move investment elsewhere. Uh, and so having that PIA, what it gives, gives investors is that certainty to know, okay, look, we have something that we can build a model on, uh, because if you're going to make in any, if you're planning to make any investment anyway, you've got to run your financial model 
Um, we're all chartered accountants and we're very, very much familiar with that. You've got to run your financial model, do your forecast, and, and those financial models will have some tax elements in it. Now, if you have some level of uncertainty, it's difficult for you to forecast what will happen in the next five to 10 years, especially when you know that there's a law that has been in, at the back burner for quite some time. You know, so what we since we have that PIA now, it gives gives us that certainty. Now, speaking on whether it will uh, give us the kind of um, the desired result that we want in terms of attracting investment, uh, what I would like to say is that um, investors would typically just evaluate um, the attractiveness of of um, any fiscal terms that you have along along various you know lines. It all depends on. You know what they are looking at you, you you're looking at stability of the um contract terms that you have you're looking at contract sanctity as well you're also looking at the competitiveness of the physicals uh, and of course license rights so you're comparing with other countries what is obtainable elsewhere uh, and beyond that you're also looking at you know what is the climate the, the business environment like because you can have fantastic fiscals um, if the environment is very, very toxic for investors, it makes it very difficult. So uh, what I would like to say is, you know, with, with all that, investors can then, you know, do their models, um, look at the fiscal terms that we have, um, compare them with the other jurisdictions, like maybe Angola and other places where you have um, crude oil discovery, and um, see whether it's something that uh, is worth their while. If you ask me, uh, the PIA does provides really, really interesting um, provisions uh, that I would say that uh, are quite attractive, particularly in the, in the gas sector. Uh, if you look at what, the, what, what Nigeria is trying to do, we're trying to increase, you know, gas utilization. Obviously, everybody's talking about, you know, transition to clean, clean energy. So when you look at all that, um, there are different sectors or subsectors within the oil and gas industry that um, the PIA addresses, you know, and provides certain incentives all geared towards you know attracting investors um you know to, to nigeria so i would say that um it's better than what we used to have so obviously it's got something really interesting in there um that i think will attract investors so um time will, time will tell whether um the provision of the pia will eventually lead to the realization of uh, the kind of investment that we want to see in the industry thank you very much uh uh, you've actually been able to open our eyes to know that the new sign PIA definitely uh, will bring certainty for investors talking about uh, giving a good business climate and, uh, you know, having the opportunity to compare our physical uh, terms with other climates and working in line with that major aim of the government of increasing uh, our gas utilization. Uh, and I, I, I want to believe that this will definitely be, bring uh, more prosperity as desired. But let me take on this question again by asking you that, uh, can you just give us what are some key changes that uh, our professional members as chartered accountants needs to be aware of concerning this PIA so that at least we can have our own contribution even as the bill has been signed? Thank you so much, uh, John, for that question, uh, which I think is very, very apt. I think it's something that um, um, we professionals need to be aware of. Um, obviously, the PIA is broken down into three segments, uh, which I like to, uh, one of which is governance. Uh, governance basically deals with uh, issues around um, establishment of NMPC, for instance, NMPC Limited. Um, the NMPC that we currently have today uh, we then become a limited liability company with a commercial orientation. Um, so that comes under governance. You also have the establishment of the midstream and downstream um, um, petroleum regulatory authority, um, which would then regulate certain aspects of the midstream and downstream um, sectors of, of that industry. And then you also have the, um, the establishment of the Petroleum Re Regulatory Commission, you know, that would then take over the functions of, of what we currently call the DPR, Department of Petroleum Resources, some aspect of that, uh, of DPR with respect to licensing and, and other things. Um, so that's that's the part on governance. Um, so obviously you have other provisions with respect to governance, like establishment of midstream and downstream gas infrastructure fund, and, uh, and also the 
um, Frontier Exploration Fund, which generated a lot of conversation uh, in the country. Um, then you then have uh, the, seg this, the segment that we call administration. Uh, administration then speaks to various licenses that you have. Uh, in the past, we used to have um, what you call oil exploration license, oil prospecting license, oil mining lease. Uh, now what we need, what we have are new licenses, essentially the same thing, but with new name. Uh, so what we then have, you have introduction of new license type like petroleum prospecting license, petroleum exploration license, and petroleum mining licenses. So um, they kind of mirror the old, old licenses in some way, but um, they, uh, they, they just have a new name. And then, of course, you then go to the host community, that provision around the host community, which again also generated um, some form of a conversation with respect to uh, how much was going to the host community. Um, so we have that host community development trust that, will, that will, the accident provides for, um, that will have a fund, uh, essentially, um, that will be funded by the settlers. Settlers are the the operators, the, the licensees, those who have license and operate within the um, host community. And they are supposed to fund it with 3% of their annual operating expenditure uh, in preceding financial year. So what that means is at the end of every year, um, each settler within a, a, a community is supposed to you know, transfer 3% of whatever was their um, actual annual operating expenditure into the host community uh, development trust fund. Um, which would then be used, you know, to provide some needed infrastructure within that um, area. Now, we have to go to the physicals, you know, which everybody likes to talk about. Um, so there are a number of changes that we have. Uh, obviously, uh, what we, we used to know or what we currently know in the petroleum profit tax as, as investment allowance or investment uh, tax credits, you know, or investment credit has been repealed. You know, and the act then introduced what we call production allowance. Um, obviously, um, the one major change that we have done is that upstream companies will then be required to pay companies income tax, you know, at 30%, which is um, different from what we currently have in the petroleum industry, um, petroleum profit tax act. Uh, of course, you then have the introduction of hydrocarbon tax um, of 15% and or 30%, depending on the kind of license that you have. Um, so there are a number of other provisions and you then have steeper penalties for non-compliance or certain offenses within the law. So I must say that um, uh, it's no longer business as usual. Um, as long as you convert to PIA, it's no longer business as usual. It's something that um, um, as um, chartered accountant, we need to be aware of uh, so that we are well informed to advise our clients on the things that um, they need to begin to pay attention to particularly when it comes to conversion, for instance, which I, I believe we'll, we'll get into during the conversation. Obviously, you need to be aware of um, the new changes in the law and how that affects your client's business, and they begin to have that conversation around conversion. Hear me? I hope. I hope you can still hear me. Uh, th 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 thanks for those um, expose. Uh, the, in your intro, uh, I was happy I was getting some vibes. You were talking about clean energy. Um, of course, you didn't talk about it, but there are other paradigm shifts where uh, looking at fossil fuels is like Nigeria still looking backwards when others are looking forward. But let's look at this issue concerning um, clean energy. Global discussions uh, has been around, you know, talking about going on to the clean energy. Now, how does the PIA align with this in terms of putting us on the path towards this transition to clean energy? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fatuki. I think that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I must say that... Um, uh, I don't know whether I should use the word unfortunate. <laughs> Unfortunately, the PIA doesn't have specific provisions that um, kind of prove that speaks to uh, transition to uh, clean energy. But um, obviously, there are certain provisions within the PIA that supports that transition to clean energy, one of which is um, 
provision around gas flare. If you, if you if you understand what the government is trying to do, we're trying to move away from gas flaring. Uh, so you have very steep provisions within the PIE that discourages gas flaring. Um, Was um, able to claim tax deductions on the gas flare fee, but now under the PIA you don't have that. So what it means is that if you incur any expense with respect to gas flare flaring, then you will not be able to claim tax deduction. Two, um, obviously, like I said um, I, during my intro, I did talk about um, the the provisions of the PIA in some in some ex, in uh, some tries as much as possible to increase um, domestic, gas domestication and improve gas utilization. Obviously, with um, focus on gas, that will help us, you know, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel, for instance. And then you then begin to have conversation around more gas being made available in country for things that, things like uh, conversion to CNG gases. Yeah. By the sure. time you, you have such, that then reduces our reliance on um, so, but that also comes with its own cost. And uh, what I would say is that the PIA has those kind of provisions that support that transition. And then I, I must not also forget the requirement of NMPC to also engage in renewable energy. And what, so that's a statutory provision that requires NMPC to make investment in renewable energy. You know, so that also speaks to that transition to, to, to clean energy. You know, and back to the CNG issue I was talking about. You know, so if the, the some provisions that we have in the PIA that tries as much as possible or that we are hoping will lead to the kind of domestication that we want to see in the in the gas sector for instance what that would do is that it will increase um, the amount of gas that we have in country obviously to do that there are other issues that we need to deal with around gas investment things around um, uh, dealing with issues like um, uh, improving our gas infrastructure and um, gas pricing and all that, because currently the PIA has certain provision that speaks to uh, continued um, regulation of, of gas prices. Obviously, that's not the kind of thing investors want to see. Um, we want to see a market that is um, a willing buyer, willing seller type of market, which then um, encourages investors to come in. And obviously, we'll, it will make the IOCs, for instance, to begin to adhere to, um, to the domestic gas supply obligation that we have in the PIA, so or gas domestic gas delivery obligation that we have in the PIA, and what that would do is to increase the amount of gas that we have locally. What we can then do with that gas, you know, is I mean, is is enormous. You're talking about LPG, uh, cooking gas, the CNG that I talked about. So obviously that helps us to shift, you know, our focus from petrol, for instance, for car, to using CNG gases, and eventually. Um, we can get to where we really want to get to. Oh, super. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for those elucidations. And I can see that our online participants are uh, coming on. May I ask, Shesor, uh, could you please field the question from Oluchi Sanusi? Okay. Chiwendu, uh, I can see from Oluchi Sanusi asking us that... Uh, what is the profit sharing contract like and how viable is it possible to retrieve one's capital with this current infrastructure deficit in line with the PIA? Thank you so much, uh, Olusi. Sanusi, I think I hope I got the name correctly. Um, interesting yeah. question, I must say. <laughs> I think speaking about viability of uh, production sharing contract, um, it's uh, first of all. Um, it all depends on the terrain that you're operating in. Um, obviously, for production sharing contracts, you want to see players in the deep offshore. You know, um, you most likely see um, joint venture arrangement within onshore and shallow waters. Uh, so, for production sharing contracts, you're looking at a, a higher risk terrain. Uh, and speaking about the viability of, of such arrangements, all depends on where you're playing. You know. Um, like I said, it's a high risk terrain. So you need to then ask yourself whether the fiscal that we have in the PIA is, is attractive enough for you to play in that area. Now, if you look at what we have in the PIA, for instance, hydro the guys in the 
the companies that will be operating within the deep offshore are completely exempt from hydrocarbon tax. You know, so that is an incentive for someone who wants to play in that area. Now you're asking how viable it is to retrieve your capital within this current infrastructural deficiency in line with the PIE. Now, and if you are looking at the PIE itself and looking at, um, if, I, if, if, if I'm looking at your question and I'm asking myself, if you stay with um, crude oil production within the deep offshore, for instance, look at what um, crude oil price is doing today. Um, you, you, you would agree with me that um, at the time people made their forecast, you know, sometime last year, nobody expected um, crude oil prices to be shooting over $100 today. So um, obviously, um, you then need to look at some clauses that you have within the production sharing contract that you have with the government uh, to evaluate that in line with what we have to, what we have in, in the PIE to see how how well you can recover your cost. You know, but if you ask me, uh, recovery of cost um, is a question of um, the kind of contract that you have, especially when you're talking about production sharing contracts. There are certain provisions within PSCs that um, speak to cost recovery, which is an arrangement you then have with, with NMPC or NMPC Limited as well, uh, to know okay, how much cost you can recover and at what time. I, I don't know whether that, that answers uh, his question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. NHG. And I, 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 I am aware very acutely uh, before we came on this program that a lot of my friends from oil and gas, oil service are on. And so I will be doing a lot of justice by talking about licensing. Uh, and concerning licensing, I'd like to get this clarification from you. Will the existing license holders under the PPT be required to convert to the new license under the PIA? Thank you so much. Eh? That's an interesting question. Um, interestingly, the PIA also provides for that. And now, but it all depends on the kind of license that you have. So if you are a marginal field producer, for instance, because there are, there are fields that are categorized as marginal fields. If you're a marginal field producer, you are then you are required to convert to PIA within 18 months from the inception of the act, which I think will expire by December or thereabouts, the, the act was signed into law in August last year. So by December, um, if you have if you're a marginal free, free producer, then you should be making you know plans to convert. Now, um, for every other license holder um, that is not a marginal field producer, what the law says is that you can voluntarily convert if you want, so you can do your own, do an evaluation of the PIA and your own business forecast to see okay, whether it favors you to convert now or you wait at the time you're about to renew your license. So at the time you're about to renew your license, you must convert to PIA. So at that point, you no longer have that um, uh, flexibility of deferring that conversion. You only have that now if your license is still up and running and you're not a marginal field producer, you have that flexibility of either convert, deciding to convert now if you want to, or wait till you're about to renew your license. Hmm. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And I'd like to make this announcement to our online participants. If you are just coming in, we've been looking on ICANN on air segment of the program, question and answer today. The Nigerian Petroleum Industry Act 2021 and us, Chartered accountants, I just say, also friends of the profession, looking at matters arising. And we've been fielding, we've been fielding Mr. Energy, who has been throwing a lot of lights into hidden areas, perhaps that many do not know, and kind of resurfacing the already surfaced knowledge that some of the practitioners uh, already have. I am very happy that uh, students who are also online are learning some of those nitty gritties. Um, please keep your questions coming. We will field 
as many as we possibly can. And I'm going to be yielding to my co-anko, Cheson, to fire the next question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chiwendu, NHA. I, I think having an understanding of uh, the last question by the anchor on the licensing, let me ask this question again, that uh, is it possible uh, that the PIA provide for transfer or assignment of a license or permit by industry uh, operator? Thank you, sir. So um, again, speaking about licensing, yes, we have that, we have a provision within the PIA that um, obviously allows you to, you know, transfer your license you know, to someone else if you feel like um and maybe the economics of a particular uh, investment doesn't you know, favor you anymore or you like to move elsewhere you can't relinquish that license and transfer it to someone else however um such transfer or you know has to be made uh, with the consent of the minister uh, the minister of petroleum so the minister needs to okay such transfer uh before you or our assignment and I'd like to also mention that um, uh, because I've had, you know, the course of my own career, I've had clients come to me and ask whether um, if I'm just selling shares within a company that has an asset or a license, can that be deemed to be a transfer of that license? Uh, and I'd like to say it here, and the law, the PIA also speaks to that as well, uh, where you have um, a, a share transaction and someone is acquiring the shares of a company that has a license, and the new acquirer then takes a controlling um, interest within that company that is deemed to be a transfer that requires the consent of the minister before that transaction can be consummated. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dechi. I'm going to give you a bit of a breather now and announce that we are going to be uh, going on a short break. And when we come back, we get more insights from Mr. Energy, especially in areas of companies operating in different levels of the value chain and how do they separate their operations. Please stay connected. We will be back with you very shortly. Thank you very much for staying on. And thank Mr. Chinwendu. And before we went on break, we, I was asking you um, that we know that the PIA provides the companies operating in different levels of the value chain must separate their operations. 
in your opinion, how will this provision influence the operations of these companies and the flow of their operations? Hmm. I'm not sure if uh, you, you, you okay. You have to unmute. Oh, yes, please, please unmute. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I think I was muted. So I was saying that um, uh, it's another interesting question. Uh, I think it's something that even uh, operators are also having to deal with. It's okay. How do we then manage our operations um, um, with the new PIA that we have? If if we should convert today, how do we then deal with that? Because what you have is a situation where for every segment of uh, of operation within the, the industry are then required to have a separate license and also have a separate company um, running that business. I, I'll give you an example. So you have a company that um, currently it's into upstream um, petroleum operations and you have gas, you also could have a, a downstream uh, business, a gas processing and, and distribution and all that. And you can currently you can do all that within one company and just have different um, uh, streams of income, you know, coming in, into the same company. But now what you have in the PIA is that for you to be able to do that, you you are required to have separate companies and separate with separate licensing licenses doing that. Uh, so we are going to have a situation where upon conversion, you're going to have you know issues around transfer of assets. And now that um, reorganizing, you know, the business, transferring the existing licenses and businesses and assets to a new company. Uh, so, if I speak to, if I speak on companies that have both upstream, maybe crude and a gas investment, obviously, uh, it kind of affects the business because under the Petroleum Profit Tax Act, and um, also. Um, what we what we used to call a associated gas framework arrangement, um, it kind of allows companies to um, consolidate their costs. So you, you can take your gas cost against your crude oil um, income. And obviously that um, allows you to make a quicker recovery because the tax rate under the PPTA, that Petroleum Profit Tax Act, is higher than what we have in the company's income tax, which is 30%. And so if I'm able to take my gas costs against my crude uh, revenue, I make a quicker recovery because my my I'm taking that cost against a higher tax rate, as against taking it against a lower tax rate. And uh, so with this new law in the PIA, I will no longer be able to do that uh, because I then have to, I would then have to set up a new company to run that gas business. So whatever gas costs I incur, we then sit within that business. So obviously that is going to affect existing, uh, the economies of existing um, investment and future investment. Uh, because if you have a, a, an investment that runs beyond, uh, let's say 10, 20, you know, 25 years, and the licenses that support that uh, investment will probably expire before um, or expire in, in, in time soon. What, what that means is that, that that company will then be forced to convert to PIA and then split that business into maybe three, four companies with different licenses. And all that benefit that um, you would have um, gotten, you know, by taking your cost against the crude revenue, your gas cost against your crude revenue, you are no longer able to do that. However, um, um, it's not all doom and because you then still have uh, in, uh, incentive for people that play in the gas sector, for instance. Um, so if you are into maybe gas transportation, there's, an, there's a tax holiday for you. If you're into gas utilization, there's a tax holiday. So the law recognizes the fact that you, we had um, uh, some sweeteners or some incentive that encouraged people to consolidate both gas and crude cost and recover, make a, a, a quicker recovery. And in taking that away, what is done is to then provide some incentive to encourage people to still, you know, go into uh, gas investment. Because one of the things that investors used to consider was the fact that, okay, I could take um, a deduction against uh, of my gas cost, take it against my crude revenue. But now that I'm not able to do that, the question then is, what then can I rely on? What is the sweetener for me to go into, you know, gas, gas investment? 
which we then have the tax holidays that um, are currently there. So obviously that also will create some administrative uh, burden because where you have one company that used to file, um, you had just a separate company with people and all that running that company. Now you're probably going to have like four or five companies because you don't have multiple licenses. Obviously that comes with uh, compliance cost as well because you're going to have to prepare, um, pay a statutory auditor or uh, to prepare um, um, an account for you. Uh, you also have to pay a tax consultant to you know, review what you've done and assist you with tax filing. So all that comes with costs. So it's something that um, the operators are then having to battle with to say, look, uh, with this provision then requires me to have multiple companies that I'm going to be running. In some instances, you may then need to have um, separate finance function, uh, you know, depending on how you want to structure uh, the business. Uh, but obviously it comes with its own um, headache as well. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful response uh, to that question. Before I bring my question, let me recognize Omotayo or Rosoya. Uh, he wants to know if there are provision for smaller companies to be for contract in PIE as in the former PPE from the OIC and other players. Well, obviously, um... What the PIA is trying to do, and particularly in the uh, downstream sector, is to encourage indigenous players, which is why, um, which is one of the reasons why you still have the provisions around um, uh, what's it called price regulation, uh, because the whole essence is to uh, avoid um, monopoly within the market, and to encourage a free market environment where um, both smaller players can come in and bid for contracts you know so to answer your question the, the way the, the PIA encourages that you know now uh, it doesn't have specific provision that says um small companies we need to bid for contract but when you look at a certain several provisions in, in the PIA you you then find out that it encourages it's the whole essence is to encourage smaller players and uh, to participate within the within the industry and then avoid a situation of monopoly Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, Omotayo is uh, satisfied with that uh, response. Uh, let me take you up on this as how to border on the regulations. Uh, one of the chapter of the PIE, border on regulation guiding operations of a company in the host community. Uh, do you believe that these provisions will improve the welfare of individuals in those communities you mentioned this in your intro talking about certain percentage that the people need to just respond yeah i mean thank you again for that question um if i'm sure we're all familiar with the agitations of of the people in the niger delta for instance um, um we, we, every now and then we are having discussions around how much goes to that area and um how much um infrastructural development we have in that area and how much benefit do they have, you know, given the fact that uh, a lot has been, you know, taken out from their region. Now, what I would say with respect to the uh, host community development trust fund is that what the law, you know, attempts to do or is to ensure that, unlike what we currently have, where you have, let's say, NDDC, for instance, uh, Niger Delta Development Commission, and companies basically, um, fund NDDC, and the NDDC can then decide on what to do with, with the fund. Now, what you have with the host community development trust is that the act the, the requires, you know, each company, each settler, you know, as, as the act calls it, is required to then set up the host community development trust, you know, for the benefit of the host communities, you know, where they, they operate. Now, for that purpose, what the settler is then required to do is the settler would appoint and authorize the board of trustees. You know, so when they have the, the so the board of trustees, they will essentially run the trust. Now, for in terms of funding, what the law provides for is that three percent, like I didn't mention at the beginning, three percent of the actual annual operating expenditure in, in, in the immediately preceding financial year of each set law with respect to the operations within that area will be required, you know, they, they are required to fund 
to transfer 3% of that cost to the host community development trust fund. Now, obviously what the fund, the, 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 um, uh, the trust can then decide how to disburse that fund. Now, the interesting thing is that um, given that you have a board of trustee, the composition of that board of trustee will also include members of the community. You know, so, and it's not get a case of the uh, board determining what project to do. Given the fact that you have members of the com com community there, they can then evaluate the kind of project, you know, that needs to be um, um, built or whatever it is that that community needs, you know, they evaluate the needs of the community and then fund that project. So what that does is that you have the voices of the community members within the trust, you know, determining what exactly the fund should be used for and not just um, the board itself without contribution from the members of the, uh, the community deciding what is good for the community. The community members will play a huge role in saying what they want and what the, the trust will do is essentially to fund uh, such developmental projects. So I would say that um, it's a good arrangement because um, um, it kind of allows the community members to, to, you know, to have a voice you know, with respect to how the fund is, is deployed. Super, super, Mr. Enechi. The governance provisions for fiscal and otherwise getting the host community to be, part, you know, partakers and the way you have um, tried to enumerate it, hopefully uh, in strategy, implementation <laughs> becomes a graveyard. Thanks for all that. Mm. As, as we are driving this to a close, I'd like to, us to come back to gas. Um, based on the PIA, what are the incentives available for companies looking to invest in the gas sector? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fasinke. Um, I think I did touch on a bit of it um, when I was just you know, answering one of the questions. Uh, obviously, you have some incentives that uh, we have in the PIA uh, that speak that speak uh, to gas investors. Uh, one of which is um, a tax holiday if you are into gas utilization. And the question then is, um, what uh, what is gas utilization? You know, gas utilization essentially refers to activities that involve the use of gas as feedstock. You know, such as gas to liquid you know plants petrochemical industries, uh, fertilizer plant, power plant, uh, mini NLNG plant, and things like that. So if you're engaged in that, the law says that you are entitled to a tax holiday of up to five years. Now, um, if you're also engaged in, a, a, if you have like a pipeline, you know, for transportation of gas, you also then have additional incentive of another five-year tax holiday. So for engaging in, in, in gas alone, you could get as high as 10 year tax holiday. And which is, I mean, it's not something that we used to have, uh, it's not what, what we have in the current laws. You know, so if you ask me, it's something that I would think is attractive enough for anybody who wants to play in that space. Because yeah. obviously what the government is trying to do is to encourage uh, investment in, in gas. And, but again, like I did mention, there are some other things that I still believe that uh, we need to be taking care of other than just the uh, fiscal incentives. There are other issues that have bedeviled the, the gas industry, you know, like yeah. infrastructure, you know, gas pricing and all that, and yeah. obviously um, effective demand, which is what the PIA is trying to, you know, address you know, when you speak about uh, the uh, domestic gas supply obligation, which yeah. the PIA attempts to uh, or wants to enforce to make sure that the IOCs adhere to the domestic gas supply of, 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 of obligation. Fantastic. And uh, Mr. NHE, uh, as an accountant, and as me as an accountant, and friends of accountants, and people who know little accounting, but uh, die hard business, men and women, SMEs, uh, I will not let you out without asking this very important question. 
Now, the PIA is on temporary suspension, perhaps for eight months. And, um, and, and so these incentives that you've spoken about that uh, investors would have just rushed in is now standing still. The double whammy about that is that uh, the plot is going for about 130. I believe that 130 as we speak on the back of the Russian um, Ukraine uh, unrest. And so, uh, government is not enthused that with this plot going up, uh, naturally the subsidy, <laughs> the question of subsidy that <laughs> has put the gateway in. I'd like to ask you, it looks like a quagmire. As we speak, across the nation today, uh, I mean, diesel is going to close to about 500 naira per liter. Uh, the PMS, only God knows being sold, uh, you know, at the black market rates. The production quota that we have been given by OPEC, 1.7, we're just doing 1.5, 1.6. So the double whammy is that we are losing up there, we are losing down, down there. What will be your advice to the operators? One, two, to government to get out of this quagmire, at least in the short term. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think you've used the right word, which is, which is quagmire, because it's, it's actually a big mess. And um, yeah, you're, you're spot on on saying that our production uh, profile has really, I mean, for a very long time, the plan has always been to do at least about, you know, to do above what we're currently doing. We're not even meeting our OPEC quota, you know. <clears throat> so, and for us to do that, uh, or rather, the reason we are not meeting our open quota, or the reason we are not producing as much as we we want to produce, is not unrelated to the fact that the kind of investment that we've always been clamoring for within the industry hasn't been there uh, in a very long time. I, I'm not aware of any IOC or any company that has made fresh investments in the oil and gas industry. What companies are essentially doing is just doing well maintenance, trying as much as possible to increase production from existing wells. Uh, because for you to then make fresh investments, you've got to be mindful of uh, the changes that could happen to the fiscal, you know, which is why I spoke about the certainty that we currently have with the PIA. So what we expect is to see some form of um, gradual increase in investment, you know, with respect to, you know, maybe new wells being drilled, and new acreages and being found and all that. So um, for government, for instance, and speaking about um, subsidy, you know, and we're not being able to benefit from the upward uh, movement in, 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 in crude oil price. Obviously, if you look at how much the NNPC is spending to fund subsidy, you realize where the supposed ex excess crude revenue that we ought to have, where it's going into. You know, so um, it's, it's a big problem. Rather than having that, in the past, we used to have that an account called excess crude account. I'm not sure how much is in that account today because uh, what ought to go into that account is now being used to fund the subsidy. And the subsidy issue is a very, very uh, sensitive issue in the country. Uh, if you ask me, um, um, uh, a lot of people have said uh, that we need to remove subsidy, and which is, which is the right thing. But again, you also need to be mindful of the economic impact of subsidy removal. Uh, when you look at um, the impact of COVID-19 to um, businesses in the country, and people essentially even just trying to come out, you look at the inflation rates, unemployment and all that, you've got to marry that you know, with, with removal of subsidy and the kind of impact it will have on the economy. You know, so while it is good to remove subsidy, in doing that, um, timing is very important to say, okay, how do we do that? And when you are removing subsidy, do you have any cushion um, that you're going to put in place, you know, to sort of cushion the impact that Rumba will have, because is it going to have impact? Oh, yes. If you take our subsidy today and Nigerians begin to buy petrol at, you know, market price, you'll probably be spending as much as 350 or close to 400 naira per litre. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that will have impact on transportation costs as well. You know, so the average man on the street 
um, who will probably be paying 100 naira from one end to the other, will probably have to pay about 200 or 250. So when you look at all that, the question then is, what other thing is the government doing, you know, to cushion the effect that that subsidy removal will, will have? Now, Super. But should, we remove, but should we remove that subsidy? We should do that and begin to adjust to our realities, really. Yeah. You know, in so fact, what I would say part to of, the government part, is... Part of, part, of those, part of those realities, Mr. Enechi, is competition. Um, just like we have in television. Exactly. And it goes on and on. But we've got to be able exactly. to buy the bullets, do it transparently, with character, with capacity, with compassion. And uh, what have you? Uh, I'd like you to give us your final words on this topic. Um, just your parting words. Yeah, I mean, I like to say that um, uh, the PIA is a game changer. And um, as chartered accountants and practitioners, um, it's important that we're very um, aware of the provisions of the PIA um, as it speaks to how the oil and gas industry is going to be transformed sure. and how it, it will um, impact on, on the businesses of the companies that we, we, we all provide services to. You know, so um, like I said, at, at some point, it's no longer business as usual. Uh, things are changing and uh, you can't afford to sit on the sideline. Yeah, we're right. saying that um, the PIA has been suspended for, for some time, but you're, you're not going to have to wait till the suspension or the delay, the delay, the implementation is lifted. This is the time for you to be aware of what is going on is now. And you, um, I like to also, I would like to also say a big thank you to uh, the institute, uh, especially to to our president, uh, and for making this, providing this platform for us to share uh, ideas and share expertise. I think um, our members and online listeners will greatly benefit from this. And and I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, Mr. Aki Fatunke. You're doing a fantastic job, I must say. Uh, I've I've listened to a few of the program, and I must say that um, it keeps you you know on. It's not something that you want to tune into, and then switch up there's always something you you're going to learn. even you, i myself <laughs> i myself who has who's been i mean who is a tax expert it thank was an you very to very to much uh, mr energy and um is the tip of the iceberg of course you've seen my editorial team uh, who are in the background i'd like to thank you i would be asking you to come back i'd like to thank and i like i know like our online participants and guests thank for your questions well, our next episode is going to be Thursday, March 10, 2022. The venue will still be the ICANN online platforms, Facebook, YouTube at 6 p.m. West African time. The topic we are going to be looking at is insecurity and identity management. Our guests will be Andrew Echano, FCA, FCTI. Andrew Echano is a holder of a licenses business competence from European Council for Business Competence in Vienna. Spent years navigating the waters of accounting, finance, audit, IT, project development and management organization capacity building and grants management. He is currently a service contractor with the U.S. government. I'd like to ask my co-anchor very briefly your bye-bye words for us on this episode. Uh, the session today has been actually superb. I just want to tell our viewers, our listeners, our participants, don't miss the episode on Thursday talking about the identity. It's going to be another level that we will take the icon on air to. See you definitely on Thursday. Same time, same place, and the same online platform. I'd like to quickly join to say that the icon... Night International Accountants Conference, um, which is the UK uh, version, with the theme social and economic climate challenges and opportunities for reengineering the accountancy profession, takes place between the 10th, 11th, and 12th in 2022 um, at the Rochester Street, London, SE165H. And um, you can make inquiries from Mr. Shegun Omar Yarewa, the chairman of the ICANN UK chapter. I mean, I'll drop this quotation. 
Let me join the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria to wish our women folks in this one happy International Women's Day and tie with what our president had mentioned earlier. And I put this quote from her. Together with our male colleagues, we believe that we can create a better world. We believe we can build a society characterized by peace and progress, inclusive growth and meaningful development. That quote is attributable to Mrs. Comfort, Uluwe Itayo, MNI, FCA, the 57th ICANN president. And I say the sun sets on our program today. I want to come your way. Thursday, March 10, 2022, I say, be the change you always like to see. I remain Akifatunke, your anchor. I can on air. Bye for now.